Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint this bulldog and this is going to specifically focus on how to paint short white fur in acrylics. So I did this for a full length tutorial available on Patreon so the nearly 7 hour version is available over there now if you'd like to watch that I'll link my Patreon channel in the description below. Now like all of my pet portraits I always start with the eyes first. The reason being that is the soul and it's where most of the expression is going to really form that portrait. So I like to make sure that I get the eyes done first. So here I am just mapping in my basic shapes. I start to put in my highlights and being that it's a bulldog with that breed where they do have that lower eyelid area visible, I do want to make sure that I've got the pinks, purples and some of the blue colours that are also included there. Now on the considerably slower footage on Patreon, I really do go in depth with all of the processes. Now the base layer stage, I think regardless of the medium, I like to make sure that I pay quite close attention to that reference photo very early on. The reason being, it is the foundation for our details, so I do like to make sure I get it as accurate as I can. I'm not really focusing on the exact colour, but I am making sure that I'm mapping in my shapes, my main shadows and highlights. When you're working on a bulldog or a pug where they do have that skin, those wrinkles and creases in the middle of the face, the fur direction is going to change considerably. Now I speak about this a lot in my top tips for painting fur, which I will link in the description below. It's available on YouTube if you haven't seen that yet. And in that video, one of those top tips is the fur direction. When we are painting these creases, the fur direction is forced in different ways compared to other breeds because of the extra skin they have on their face. It is therefore going to ultimately change what that animal looks like if we don't get that fur direction accurate from the beginning. I want to make sure here that I'm getting as close as I can to the reference photo. Depending on the scale that you're working on, and this was an 8 inch round canvas board, so it's not big, but I can still indicate at that sort of that bone and muscular structure underneath the skin. And that is the reason why I pay really close attention to it very early on. If this fur direction is slightly off, it will change the proportions, what that animal looks like, which is obviously not what we want. So I want to make sure that the area that I'm working in, I do zoom into that area on my tablet to make sure that I am only focusing on that one portion at a time. And when it comes to painting fur in acrylics, I always work from dark to light. You'll notice that I'm building up my layers gradually. I start off with a slightly darker base layer and then I'm building up from there. It's really easy when you're painting white fur to just have a little bit more of a flatter appearance because where it only contains what we think of as that one colour, it's very easy to just add only two or three layers. The problem with that is we will not have the same degree of depth as what I'm going to be creating here where I am applying 10 to 12 layers in some areas. And obviously in that slower version on Patreon, I'm mentioning and explaining why each of these layers are so crucial. In most of my tutorials, I speak about the importance of our subtle layers. These are what build up the depth. I think that these are an important part of every single painting. The reason being, at the time, they may not make a huge difference, but by the time you add the additional layer on top, that subtle layer that you have included will add that much more depth to that fur. Now that's going to depend on the type of fur texture that we are trying to rep sort of replicate there. With this bulldog it's short fur but on the top of the face the fur is slightly longer than other parts like on the muzzle. So I have to make sure that I'm doing the right brush strokes and how I'm moving that brush, how I'm layering that fur in order to replicate that specific fur texture. I think white fur is one of the ones where people assume that it's one of the easier ones to get right because it's only really one colour, but that's very far from the truth. I think personally it's one of the most complex ones to get right. Although we're only looking at what we think of as white, white is never white. It reflects lots of other colours and there are many tonal value and the differences there that make that fur realistic. The, with this amount of layers here, I am not still at this point just using pure titanium white. There are many different colours that I have mixed there. And in some cases, like with this bulldog here, I'm going to have to layer a very subtle pink over the top. The reason being, these shorter coated breeds, you are going to see some of that skin colour showing through. Now of course, I don't want to be painting the fur pink, that will not look right, but here I am working with glazes in order to achieve that look. 
Glazes is one of the things that I work a lot with with my acrylics work. That's why I like Liquitex Basics. Many people have said that they are too transparent for the way that they like to layer and that's perfectly fine. But for me, because I do like working with glazes, the Liquitex Basics works really well for how I like to layer and how I like to achieve this kind of realism. The reason being, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to get the colour right. Even something like this. Look at how many different types of colours I'm mixing, the different greys, whether or not I say warmer grey or a cooler grey. There are many things here where I'm looking at that reference photo. I'm really absorbing all that information that that photo is giving me and then mixing my colours based on that. But to start with for these layers, I am just mainly blocking in my lights and my darks. The reason being, because glazes work so well with adjusting that colour, I'm going to be able to add that colour at my later layers. I don't have to be worrying and stressing myself out about that at the early stage. And the reason why I speak about this so often in my tutorials is because colour selection can really hold us back. It's one of the ones where we can spend far too long trying to mix the exact right colour that we can see in that reference photo, but we really don't have to do that. I personally like to focus more on my contrast, so here you'll see I'm really darkening up my shadows and I'm really hyping up my highlights. If I've realised that my colour is slightly off, I don't overly worry about that, but I do know that I can easily fix it at the end of the portrait with a simple glaze. And the reason why I don't focus too much on the exact colour here is because if let's say it was taken on a sunny day and then the photo of this dog was taken 10 minutes later, when the clouds went over the sun, the colour of this fur is going to be slightly different. It may contain more bluer, cooler colours within that white fur. By focusing on my contrast, I'm still going to make sure this dog looks like this dog. So if this was a pet portrait commission, that owner would still be able to see that it was their bulldog. Because when you are taking pet portrait commissions, let's say you ask your client for five photos of that animal. You can guarantee that almost every single photo will show a slightly different coloration of that animal, even when it is a white dog like this. And that ultimately is all due down to the light source and the environment of which that animal was in at the time that that photo was taken. So one other element that I was focusing on here with this white fur is that I had to make sure that I got that softness right and I spoke about this a few minutes ago. The top section of the head here was naturally softer compared to the fur that was in between the eyes. I had to make sure that I softened out some of my brush strokes. Obviously as I say the Patreon version is significantly slower. All of this type of footage is kept all in real time so I can really explain and show you how I'm moving that brush in order to create that type of fur texture. But there are different techniques that you can use to create this. Now one of the ones ways of doing that is with various blending options and this one tutorial focuses on the three main ways that I like to do that. You can use a fine mist sprayer bottle which I use on the chest and the muzzle area. You can use a clean damp brush to just sort of more push that paint around to soften out your edges. And then you can use the paint itself and just do a bit of wet on wet blending. That technique works really well if you work a little bit faster. But then the fine mist sprayer bottle comes into play with that because you can keep those layers wet for as long as you want and then work similar to how you would with oils. Now the blending technique there with a fine mist sprayer bottle and, and, and how you can do that with backgrounds and so on, I do have in another video that's available here on YouTube and that's just how to blend with acrylics. So I'll also link that in the description below if that's of interest. One other thing as well, going back to the colour and white fur, that because white fur is naturally very reflective, it is going to pick up on the colours in the environment. This reference photo, which is provided with the line art on Patreon for those who want to follow along, the dog here was actually resting on a yellow ball. So most of the fur on the muzzle that I'm starting to paint here and specifically on the chest and the neck area had a very strong yellow glow effect. When you're working on pet portraits where you've only been asked to paint the head and shoulders like what I've done here, that is where I would then remove that yellow colour from my painting. The reason being, we are not including that ball in this portrait of this dog here. So therefore the yellow wouldn't make sense. Someone would look at this portrait and think, why is the artist painted it yellow? If, however, you were painting the full portrait of and the photo as it was and including the ball, 
the yes, then I would go ahead and add that yellow colour within that white fur. It is just something to bear in mind and takes a little bit of that pre-planning decision before you start that portrait. But for me personally, that is the way that I like to work. So when I'm working with that head and shoulder option and there is that reflective colour, the same with grass. If this animal was led down, for instance, and there was a strong green reflection from the grass, which can happen very easily with white fur, if I was not including any of the grass in my painting, I would take that green tint out. So throughout the muzzle area of the base layer stage, you saw that I was using a larger blending brush and every so often you saw what looked like a fine fog. That there was me using the fine mist sprayer bottle, applying a layer of water and then I was blending that paint together to get a really nice soft foundation. And that is one of my biggest tips when you're working with a shorter coated animal. It doesn't matter on the colour, so regardless if this was a brown or a black dog, I would still want to make sure that my base layers are fairly soft. The reason being, when you're painting short fur, it's harder to get that softer, shorter fur appearance when you're trying to fight with harsher, solid lines for your base layer. So I do spend that extra couple of minutes making sure that my layers are blended. And it only does take literally an extra couple of minutes to do that. So if that type of technique is of interest, as I've said, I go in depth with that in that Patreon version. Another aspect that I talk a lot in depth with in the tutorials, both on YouTube and Patreon, is the fur length. It makes such a difference. If I was to make my brush strokes on the muzzle here as long as they were on the face, I am going to be adjusting the texture, making it look like the muzzle is as soft and as long as the fur on in between the eyes and the top of the forehead. That is ultimately then going to change the texture of the fur in that area. I need to pay really close attention to that. So there are a few things here that I want to focus on. The fur length, the fur thickness, so in terms of how much pressure you put on that brush, and then that fur direction. Those three things are really important regardless of the animal that you're painting. And that brings me on to the brushes that you can use. Now again, this tutorial, I really do focus on using a few different types of brushes so that members who are following along on Patreon, if they've only got maybe one certain brush, they know then that they can still follow along to this tutorial. There are a few must-have brushes that I do like to have and I would always recommend to get and they are mainly a couple of different sizes of your liner and rigger brushes. I use them an awful lot for painting realistic fur because depending on how much paint you have loaded on that brush, how much pressure you're putting on that brush and also even down to where you're holding that paintbrush, you're going to be able to create some very different fur effects. And the more that you paint, you'll find that it becomes far more natural to make one brush give you multiple different types of brush strokes depending on the fur type that you're trying to replicate. One thing as well that you'll notice here is that I always break these elements into small individual sections. I don't attack one layer at a time. The reason being, this is you know, it's a lot of detail to get into one portrait. If I work in individual layers, I'm at that ugly stage, just like what this body looks like at the moment. I'm at this stage for far too long. I personally don't find I'm as motivated and I certainly don't work as effectively. So I like to work in small sections. I get those areas about 80 to 90% complete and then I move on to the next. What I can then do is once I've got more of that animal painted in, I can then rework the last 10% and get it back up to, to where I want, nearer to completion. The layers that I like to leave until the end are things like the whiskers and the very final details that overlap everything else. So for instance, if this dog was led down and there were blades of grass overlapping the front of the chest, I would make sure that I added those in at the end because I want to be making sure that I'm painting the elements that are behind first. That's going to be a lot easier. Otherwise, you're just going to have to paint around these details that are then meant to be in front. So now that I've got more of this bulldog painted in, you can really see how important the contrasts are, especially when you're working on white fur. You can see how I've got my dark areas really dark, but then also the white fur and the brightest parts of the portrait are really bright. And that brings me on to one of my biggest tips and one of the most common questions that I'm asked, especially when we're painting white fur, and that's why are my white details not looking bright enough? The reason being usually is because you don't have what's next to it dark enough or your layer underneath is not dark enough. Both of those things can impact the end result and how bright that fur is looking. 
If you know that you're using, let's say, pure titanium white, you cannot physically go any brighter than that, but it's still not got that punchy effect that you're after, darken what's next to it up. That will then automatically make those lighter details appear more brighter and your contrast will be far better. And that brings me on to one quick thing I'd like to mention. Acrylics can sometimes get a bit of a, a bad rep for looking like they're faded. Depending on the brand that you've used and you're using your light fast colours, that's not what's happened. It's like the, with the Liquitex Basics, they dry with a matte finish. Now for me, I love that about this brand because it makes them easier to photograph. All you need to do is once your painting's finished and completely dry, just apply a gloss vin varnish to your painting and that will then make that paint look like it's wet again. Your darks will look really dark, just like how they did when the paint was wet at your very first few layers. And that could also be another reason why your brights aren't looking as bright. Once they dry, they won't gonna, you know, they're not gonna have as much of that brighter shine as what they will when it's varnished. So it's just something that you can bear in mind. When I, during this Patreon version, I do show you a couple of ways that you can check that. One of the ways is to get a brush just with a little bit of water on, wipe that across your surface, if you're making sure that underneath is completely dry, that's really important. Apply a light layer of the water with your paintbrush over the top. That's going to show you then what your artwork is going to look like when varnished. You can then judge whether or not your darks are as dark as they need and your brights are as bright as they need to be. But it's one thing that can really help. If you think that your highlights are not bright enough, wait for that to dry. Put a light layer of this water with your clean brush over the top and you'll then be able to see how bright this white fur is going to look. So this entire section of the neck and the chest here is a prime example of why I like to work with glazes and that's exactly what I'm doing here. All I'm doing is just repeating the same glaze waiting for that layer to then dry and then repeating the same process. This here as you can see is now making this fur look soft without me adding too much effort. I've had to of course put in my details to start with but for my brightening up my additional layers here glazes work perfectly whilst also putting in that slightly softer appearance. This is also down to the paints that I'm using because they are more transparent. They're allowing still those darker layers where you can see those shadows in between my details to show through. If you had more of an opaque paint, you're not gonna be able to create this same effect. So that again is also why I love the Liquitex Basics. So I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared in this video are useful. If you've got any questions about anything art related or painting white fur, do pop them in the comments below because I'm more than happy to answer them. And as I've said, if you would like to paint along to this tutorial on Patreon, the nearly seven hour tutorial is available over there now. I do have a Patreon library on my website, which I'll also link in the description. And you can have a look there at all of the tutorials that are available on Patreon before you sign up. So if this video was of use, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up. And if you want to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And I'm going to be uploading a pastel tutorial here to YouTube next week.